Good morning and welcome, and welcome to our new building. We're all very excited about that, and we're all very excited to be able to do this conference, which is really a first for us, and we're doing this jointly with our friends here at CSIS, the Southeast Asia program, and particularly with Murray Hebert, who's been so integral in all of our work over the last period here. Uh, a special word of thanks before we get started to Lindsay Hammergan especially for the work that she's done in pulling the conference together and organizing a, a terrific dinner last night. Many of our other colleagues have been uh, very integral to this. I've mentioned Murray Hebert, Southeast Asia program also, Todd Summers, Chris Daniel, Tom Cullison, Carolyn Schroet, Matt Fisher, Jessica Alp Alport, and many others. Um, many people have come a long distance to be here today. Uh, from Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Bangkok, Seattle, Atlanta, Honolulu, Bethesda, and Silver Spring, among others. Uh, and our goal day today really is to explore how to move forward uh, U.S. and regional partners collaboration in the Mekong, focused on key health challenges. We've picked a few off, as you will see, uh, over the course of the day. And we're really excited about this conference. We, we have over 300 uh, RSVPs, and I want to welcome also those who, uh, who are with us online. Uh, there are 80 or 90 people online here today, and welcome to them, too. Um, we've deliberately chosen, in the, in the design of this conference, to pick off some of the most compelling and topical subjects, to introduce some new material from CSIS, which I'll mention momentarily, to bring a mix of friends from Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, to in integrate the World Bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and an array of the most important U.S. agencies that are active uh, in this space of the Mekong and health. CDC, USAID, State Department, Department of Defense, including the Pacific Command, the Food and Drug Agency uh, Administration, including uh, Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg, who will be with us, the National Institutes of Health, and others. A few words about how this conference fits within our approach. Earlier this year, we had a task force here at CSIS on health and smart power in Asia. It was co-chaired by Admiral Fallon and General Peake. It involved two dele CSIS delegations out to the region, a number of activities here uh, in Washington, and resulted in a publication end of July, Greater Ma Mekong Health Security Partnership, which we've offered you outside. Uh, and that recommended, it, it, it laid out a vision of how we thought the U.S. might be able to move ahead uh, in partnership with countries within the region uh, focused on health security. And we made a geopolitical argument, we made a public health argument, uh, and we laid out some of the key priority areas which are reflected in the agenda today. We also immediately after that organized a small delegation that went to Myanmar with an additional stop in Thailand, and, um, and, and that has resulted in several products. Most importantly, we have uh, the analysis on Myanmar, which will be the background to our panel on Myanmar. Uh, and we have produced, uh, through Chris Daniels' efforts, we've produced a primer on artemisinin and resistant malaria, which we're publishing today and sharing with you in hard copy and electronic form, drug resistant malaria, generation of progress in jeopardy. And you'll see at the, at the onset of the ARM panel today a small a short four-minute video that we made also to try and explain causes uh, and, and, and factors involved in the con bringing about the elimination of Artemis and resistant malaria. That'll be shown right before the panel, and that is the work of Beverly Kirk and Paul uh, Friends. So I continue to believe that for geopolitical and strong public health reasons uh, that the time has arrived for a much higher U.S. engagement. Uh, in the Mekong in partnership with many of the folks that are here today from the region. Uh, we have things that are driving the agenda forward, the unforeseen Myanmar transition, which, is, which as we say is, is dynamic and turbulent and full of promise, the spread of Artemis and resistant malaria, uh, which is grabbing people's attention, the Global Fund $100 million multi-year program there. And I do hope you enjoy that. Our first panel today is meant to take the broad look uh, it's meant to look out from the region, uh, across the region, and, and, and with respect to individual states as to what the development and health potential uh, looks like. And we've kind, we, we are uh, thrilled today that we have Dr. Hien uh, from Vietnam uh, uh, and, and Dr. Ord Orr from 
Cambodia. Their bios are, are, are in the program that we uh, shared uh, with you. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Orr is the director of the Department of International Cooperation in the Ministry of Health and has an incredibly distinguished history. I urge you to take a peek at that. And Dr. Hien is the director of the National Institute of Hygiene and Epidemiology. And both of these uh, distinguished individuals who made a special effort to be here uh, are, are, have wide uh, global reputations for the work that they do in their, in their field. And we're thrilled and honored that they could be with us today. Uh, we also have with us from the USG perspective, uh, we have Patty Simone, Deputy Director uh, of the Global Health uh, Center at CDC in Atlanta. CDC has been a long partner with CSIS so over the last decade or more. And thank you, Patty, for coming and being with us. Um, and we have uh, Greg Beck, who is a Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Asia Bureau at USAID. Uh, with extensive experience in transitional states uh, and, and, and been very integral in the evolving USAID uh, strategies on um, uh, the Mekong. Uh, Patty, we've worked with very, very closely on a multitude of issues, including most recently uh, the Myanmar transition and the, and, 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 and the CDC role there, which she heads up and leads. So please join me in uh, welcoming this uh, uh, very impressive panel. We've asked, uh, we've asked uh, Dr. Hien and Dr. Orr to kick things off with a few minutes of opening top line remarks. And then we're going to turn to Patty and Greg for additional remarks. Uh, we've, uh, this is meant to be an interactive and brisk uh, round table. Uh, we're going to hear from them, and then we're going to hear from you. So we're going to try and use this hour to best advantage uh, to get them to hit the high points and then to welcome from you uh, comments and questions. And when we get to that phase, which we'll get to rather quickly, I would just urge you please to um, uh, uh, put your hand up. Uh, and, and when we come around to you, be very succinct in your intervention. And we'll bundle together three or four at a time uh, in order to, uh, to get a, a sampling of opinion and questions and then come back to our panelists. So, Dr. Hien, could you kick things off for us, please? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank CSIS very much for inviting me here uh, to share with you our experiences, our challenges, our lesson learned and recommendations to ensure health security in greater Mekong regions. And uh, you know that Vietnam, in the last 10 years, we achieved a lot to uh, control and, and prevent uh, emerging and emerging infectious diseases in our country. And uh, in prevention and control of infectious diseases is one of our first priority of government. We issue a lot of law on infectious disease prevention and control, it's a lot of guidelines, a lot of uh, documentation about how to strengthen the surveillance, the early detection and response to any emerging and infectious diseases. And uh, Vietnam has uh, remarkably reduced mortality and mobility of many infectious diseases. We uh, eliminate uh, uh, polio in the year 2000. We uh, also uh, uh, successful to control tetanus. And in the past, we uh, successful control uh, emerging infectious diseases such as SARS, avian influenza, pandemic influenza. And even now, we are at high risk for uh, H7N9 and Merck coronavirus, but no case reported in our country so far. Even we have few cases or many cases in northern part of our country in China. And uh, in the last 10 years or so, with the support of uh, USAID, CDC, Government Fund, ADB, and other international organizations, we have been implementing seven health projects on communicable diseases, prevention and control, including HIV, AIDS, avian influenza, dengue, chikungunya, worms, cytosomiasis, uh, rabies, cholera, in the greater Mekong region, in collaboration with Laos and Cambodia. 
And especially from May to uh, September this year, we uh, received support from US CDC to demonstrate uh, a global health security project. Successfully, the goal of the project is to enhance the capacity of the health system in the surveillance, in the early detection, and coordination and respond to disease outbreak in order to meet requirement of the international health regulation. And this project focus on following a specific area. First, to provide assistance in the establishment of emergency operation center at, at MOH to enhance the existing disease surveillance and outbreak response with specific focus on the inter and intra-agency coordination and collaboration. And second objective of this project is to enhance capacity of public health laboratory system. In this time, the project focus on two uh, institutes, the National Institute of Hygiene and Epidemiology in the north, and the past institute in the south, to identify uh, H5N1, H7N9, Merck coronavirus, EV71 viruses, within the required uh, time frame, within three days. We can uh, uh, announce correctly the pathogens uh, uh, of uh, infectious diseases as in, in demonstration. And the last uh, objective to enhance the application of information technology in disease surveillance to reduce the time for data collection, reporting, analysis, and sharing, and thereby enhancing early detection and rapid response to disease or outbreaks. And uh, we have achieved some indicator of million, millennium development goals even uh, three years before, such as uh, prevalence of underweight children under five years old, incidence of and, and death risk associated with malaria, and prevalence of tuberculosis, and proportion of household using an improved sanitation facility and improved rainwater source. However, the other indicators are on track. We hope that we can achieve those indicators in uh, the 2015. But for many, cases, for many indicators, inequity need to be addressed still. Because in a remote area, in a mountainous area, the indicators are still very low in comparison with the, the, the target. Uh, even uh, we achieved so many uh, uh, things, but we're still facing with many challenges. As other countries in this region, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam is considered as a hotspot for emerging fresh diseases in particular, genotics and vector-borne diseases. As a result, many, uh, many factors, including climate change, population growth, mobility, urbanization, agriculture and uh, livestock in item intensification, deforestation, and antimicrobial drug resistance and mutation. As a consequence, Vietnam is now dealing with double disease patterns. Uh, common, common diseases such as emerging and re-emerging, even the neglected diseases such as uh, rabies, cholera, dengue, hand foot mouth diseases, and, and variant encephalitis. And we're also facing with known common, common diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, injury, and many uh, mental health. Those in NCD account for more than 70% of that in our country. In addition, demand of people for higher quality for prevention, care, and treatment is increasing. Even we have made great uh, achievement in healthcare, but there's still inequity for healthcare for population residing in mountainous, rural area, and they are often from ethnic minority groups and who have lower education and are from poorest or uh, wealth quintile. And there are five uh, main program areas are of concern in future. First, to access to HIV treatment. Second, and maternal mortality rate in maternal area and among ethnic minorities. And third, uh, access to improved sanitation and drinking water in rural and maternal area. And uh, why we have seen facing economic crisis? The support from uh, international donors are being cutting down because Vietnam now become a lower middle country income. And we are sitting facing future to mobilize resources for our program. And from that achievement, we have following lesson learned and recommendation. First, there should be a strong political commitment 
and leadership of the authorities at all level, from central to uh, provincial to district and communal level, to mobilize the whole political system. Because sometimes something happens. The government only use what we mobilize the whole political system, including government, party authorities, political and social organization, and community, to respond to any emergent, uh, emergency health event. Second lesson we learned that multi sector committee for control and prevention of emerging and emerging infectious diseases at all levels should be established to ensure whole community participation. And then we have very good collaboration between MOS and other ministry. And the third, the healthcare system should be well strengthened, including curative care and preventive medicine from all levels to implement prevention, surveillance, early detection, care, and treatment. And we establish a system of rapid, system, rapid response team. They play a very important role to early detection and rapid response at all levels. And uh, the health system should be also strengthened to deliver equitable and quality services and more rapidly when required with decreasing ODA uh, for the future. And strengthening the system human resources and governance to deliver a minimum inter integrated package of prevention and curative intervention would, would be crucial. A link with education, water and air sanitation, nutrition, food security, and broader social and economic development plans, such as gender equality, gender equality, women empowerment, would be also important to address underlying socioeconomic determinants of health. And enga engaging with private sectors to not only deliver but also regulate will also be crucial in various areas such as tobacco control and breast milk substitute, substitute, substitutes. And the, the fourth lesson that uh, the information about disease should be shared correctly and timely to the public and to, uh, to the international community. And the fifth one is the resources and support should be mobilized from international organizations and other governments and should be used effectively. And all efforts and supports should be harmonized, should be based on national health strategy and plan, one health plan, and should be integrated in the existing health care system with one health plan, one health approach. And continuous capacity building is the most important intervention to sustain our achievement in the future. And the last one is a better coordination mechanism of the regional and global collaboration on surveillance, on research, on early detection and rapid response should be developed and strengthened. I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to all international organizations and governments for providing strong, strongly both financial and technical support to Vietnam. We hope that in the future we continuously receive your support in our activities. I wish you all the best and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was most impressive summary. Thank you so much, uh, and very positive. Dr. Orr, yes. floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Um, I think for Cambodia, um, we have a similar challenges uh, like Vietnam because we are in the same region, basically. Um, but first, on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Cambodia, I would like to express my deep thanks to uh, CSIS for inviting me to participate in this very important conference. And my first challenge is, is flying so far from the hot season. Now I have to adjust myself to the cold and windy season. <laughs> okay. So I have to take care of myself and how uh, I can really stand for this uh, whole day meeting. So I would like to take this uh, opportunity to address Cambodia opportunity and challenges to have, highlighting in the following points. The first one, as you may know that uh, in order to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the government, especially the Ministry of Health of Cambodia, launched the Fast Track Initiative Roadmap for Reducing Maternal and Newborn Mortality with support from our health partner. And achievement has been made so far in terms of implementing this uh, initiative. and. Um, Based on the uh, CDHS uh, 2010, it showed that uh, the decreasing uh, 
rate maternal mortality and infant mortality rate uh, a lot. For newborn mortality uh, shown remarkable decrease from 66 baby in 1,000 live births in 2005 to 45 baby live births in uh, 2010. Infant mortality under five also decreased from 83 per 1,000 live births in 2005 to 54. And maternal mortality reduced a lot from uh, 472 in 2005 to 2000, uh, 206 uh, among uh, 100,000 live births. So this is show that uh, Cambodia is on track to meet the, the MDG. But you know, as you may know, that the child and maternal mortality is still high remaining to the country in the neighboring in, in the region. So our challenge is still to um, how we can uh, do for the um, maternal and child nutrition, which is not only uh, the issue for the health sector, but also it's a cross-cutting issue. It's our also concern. And uh, we are seeking for more support to strengthen the national response to this particular intervention, which has a lack uh, compared to the investment in other areas. Further reducing the maternal mortality, uh, we require additional uh, improving in access to healthcare and birth spacing services, and increase the number and level of skill of health trained personnel, ensuring the employment to rural areas, access to emergency obstetric and newborn care, and changing care-seeking behavior during pregnancy and childbirth. Number two, since the launch of the National Health Policy and Strategy 2008 and 2015, Cambodia has achieved internationally recognized a success in combating HIV AIDS and improving the health status of women and children with the reduction of the communicable disease such as HIV AIDS, malaria, dengue, and TB. The HIV prevalence decreased from 2% in 1998 to 0.7% in 2012. However, Cambodia still faced challenges in addressing HIV, with the estimation number of 5,800, no, sorry, uh, 58,795 people living with HIV in 2013, in need of antiretroviral treatment, of which by the end of quarter two of 2013, 49,820 patients are on ARV. That include 4,566 pediatric patients. And thanks to the Global Fund in supporting fund for ART for most of these patients. It is likely that CMDG HIV target will be met, but our concern remains about resurgence of the epidemic due to changing behavior pattern and a sustainable treatment and prevention for PLHA. The major challenges now are to maintain and increase the gains in HIV education and prevention and to reduce the risk transmission among most at risk population. In partnership with Global Fund, USAID, USCDC, UNAIDS, WHO, and other partners, local and international organizations, we are continuing to address these challenges with the hope that sustainable <coughs> funding for this effort will not be interrupted. Tuberculosis prevalence rate decreased from 1,670 in 1990 to 817 per 100,000 population in 2011. Death rates of tuberculosis decreased from 155 in 1990 to 63 per 100,000 population in 2011. Thanks for technical and financial contribution from WHO, USID, USCDC, Global Fund, JICA, and other international and local organizations in fighting TB together with the Ministry of Health of Cambodia. Malaria death rate decreased from 0.65% in year 2011 to 0.29% in 100,000 population in 2012. The malaria cases are decreased from 62,690 in 2011 to 45,533 in 2012. The dengue situation still remains public health concern in the country as well as in the Mekong region. Case fatality rate of dengue in Cambodia was dropped from 0.68% in 2008 to 0.3% in 2010, but increased a bit to 0.42% in 2012, according to the National Health Congress report in March 2013. 
AOI and diarrhea as the leading cause of outpatient consultation as recorded in Cambodian National Health Statistic 2012. And the integrated management childhood illness strategy, including community integrated management childhood illness, is still being implemented as part of our effort in combating this infectious disease. Number three, although solid progress has been made for HIV, TB, malaria, and other infectious diseases, as I mentioned above, but our concern remains about avian influenza and other new emerging infections which have no boundary, such as H1N1, H5N1, and recently H7N9. In China, the research of TB, including multi drug resistant TB, and the growing menace of anti malaria drug resistance, particularly the artemisinin resistance in Cambodia's border areas. Substandard and counterfeit drugs are key factors for drug resistance in communicable disease, such as artemisinin for malaria and multi drug resistance for TB. And it may be, may be the matter for other drugs for treating non communicable disease as well. This is an issue not only for Cambodia, but for other countries in the, in the Mekong. Therefore, strengthening national authority in this area, share information and good practices, establishing point of contact for each country, prevention and control of smuggling or counterfeit drugs are most needed for better coordinated effort across the nation in the region. I would like to inform the meeting that malaria drug resistance intervention is part of Cambodian National Strategic Plan for Malaria Elimination 2011-2025. By having this strategic plan alone is not enough. It requires more effort and resources, both technical and financial, to support its implementation in order to accelerate the implementation and to achieve its goals. Aside from commitment of the Royal Government of Cambodia, health partners involved in this area include WHO, OSAID, Gate Foundation, Global Fund, ADB, and others. Even though trend of communicable disease in Cambodia has declined, yet it still requires sustained and even increased attention for continuing its intervention. Preparing and respond to emerging and re-emerging of infectious disease still need to be paid more attention and even better prepared. Joint multi-sectoral outbreak in investigation and response shall be further organized by member country, operationalized by member countries in Mekong in order to strengthen effort to combat emerging infectious threats in the region. Promote collaboration, implementation of capacity building activity and effort to support and to complement existing and ongoing activity of the country in the Mekong, focusing on strengthening coordinated response and management of these diseases, such as planning, risk communication, pandemic preparedness and response, laboratory and implementation of international health regulation, are key essential to consider and continue to be our challenges in addressing them in the region. IHR implementation requires more effort, resources, and capacity in doing this, including capacity for disease surveillance and response at port of entry, emergency and pandemic preparedness and response communication strategy in the spirit of early detection, early communication, early treatment, and cross-border collaboration based on mutual benefit and trust. Therefore, partnership between the government and health partner is recommended to be further strengthened and even explore more to identify areas of most needed to build trust and to meet mutual interests. Coordinated technical support from WHO will help the country to expedite this and other health partners such as bilateral or multilateral donors including participation or civil society for building better cooperation and capacity to address these pressing challenges are inevitable. Number four, Cambodia is currently undergoing an epidemiologic transition burden communicable disease as well as non-communicable disease. And that both need to be tackled effectively and efficiently. The more recent outlook on non-communicable disease in the country and in the region was manifested through increasing cases of cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, particularly cervical, liver, lung, breast, stomach cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases. Non-communicable diseases are estimated to account for 46% of all deaths in Cambodia. This is not an issue for Cambodia alone, but I believe that it is also posing a public health challenge in other countries in the region as well as global concern. To address this concern, 
implementing effective national and global policy on NCD prevention and control is essential. Currently, support to this NCD intervention is very limited, and it requires more resources and support from health partner. Number five, another concern for us is migration related to health issues that we shall also pay more attention in addressing how we can provide access with appropriate care to those people. These neglected areas shall be considered in coordinating effort and provide funding support through LMI initiative with the existing mechanism for ASEAN to improve access to health care and to promote care, to promote health of migrants, including dissemination of health information and health education for them. Major challenges in this, this area is how to reach non resistant migrants. Research in this area can be considered in sharing experiences and best practices from other countries that already advanced in this area shall be part of this effort. Number six, no matter what we do for addressing the above mentioned challenges, we will fail if the health system in the country is weak. Therefore, health system strengthening that often neglect shall be part of any effort and intervention regardless specific disease. Comprehensive health system strengthening packages can be further assessed. Last but not least, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all health partners who spend their tireless effort and time, technically and financially, to support Ministry of Health Cambodia. And I would like to take this opportunity to call for more support, both technical and financial, to the health sector of Cambodia that we can achieve more results in health. So thank you all very much for your kind attention. Well, Dr. Orr and Dr. Hien, uh, thank you so much for these eloquent and, and very forceful and lucid statements. I hope you'll share those with us so we can incorporate, the, incorporate them into a kind of rapporteur's report. Now, we're going to turn to CDC and AID. It's been, it's been very impressive as we've been in the region to see how much engagement and innovation and outreach both agencies, the presence and the interest uh, and, the, and the innovations underway. And so we're thrilled to have Patty and Greg with us to say a few words about those. And then following that, we'll turn to you. So Patty. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about how CDC works when we work in countries. Um, first, our primary partner is the Ministry of Health. We work side by side with the Ministry of Health, often embedded within the ministry. We have um, technical expertise, provide technical assistance and support. Uh, we work to develop a trusted partnership, building country capacity, and this plays an important role in global health diplomacy. We have regional assets in the Mekong, and we also support country to country um, assistance in the region. Um, at CDC, we have a global health strategy with three overarching goals. First, to improve global health impact. Second, to strengthen global health security. Third, to build global health capacity. And these three things are actually complementary, and I want to talk a little, just a little bit about each one of them. So first, in global health impact, we provide technical assistance in program development and um, implementation and evaluation in the areas such as HIV, malaria, um, neglected tropical diseases, TB, vaccine preventable diseases, maternal child health, and in the area of non-communicable diseases, as both of my colleagues have mentioned, which is an increasing problem in the region. And then in particular in this region, um, we work a lot with influenza and zoonotic diseases. In the area of global health security, we um, frame that work in the areas of preparedness, detection, and response. We also um, are involved in humanitarian responses and natural disasters, as well as refugee situations. And finally, in the area of um, global health capacity, we work with countries to build their capacities in um, areas such as surveillance, epidemiology, other information systems, laboratory capacity, which is closely linked to the, to the epidemiology, and workforce capacity um, in, our, um, in our program that's called the Field Epidemiology Training Program, which is based on CDC's EIS, Epidemic Intelligence Service, which are the disease detectives. For example, um, we worked, started working with the Thai Ministry of Public Health 30 years ago to help build the, their FBTP, and now there are graduates um, throughout the leadership positions in the Ministry of Public Health from, from that program. 
just to say an, another word about FETP, this is not just a training program, but really what it does is build a, a culture of using data for decision making and also builds a um, capacity for outbreak response. Finally, the other capacity that we work on is uh, building national public health institutes. Wherever the CDC director goes, he gets asked um, by country counterparts, can you help us build a CDC in our country? We started working with China um, more than 10 years ago to help them build what they call the China CDC, even though the term CDC doesn't actually mean anything in Chinese. This, having a National Public Health Institute serves as the umbrella for all the essential public health functions and the systems to support them. As far as global health security, it makes a, a lot of sense in this region to focus on global health security. There are multiple countries in a small area. There's extensive border areas, there's extensive movement, and this is really a hot spot for emerging infectious diseases. As I said, we, we term our work in, um, in, by prevent, detect, and respond. Some examples of that for prevent is working in the areas of biosecurity and biosafety, developing capacity for a biosafety cabinet um, certification, for example, in Thailand and Cambodia. For detect, this is laboratory and diagnostic cap capabilities, working with countries to do lab assessments, um, again in Thailand and Cambodia, and also working on influenza and respiratory disease um, diagno diagnosis and surveillance. And finally, respond, for example, um, building emergency operations center capability, as, as you've heard that we were working in, in Vietnam. And this is not just computers, but actually having the staff trained to, to do the incident command response and having a network of information systems to, um, to support the response. There's, I think a good example is the work, the, the recent response of H7N9 in China. When you look back at how um, SARS um, played out in China with delays in detection, delays in reporting, not sharing of information. And since that time, we and many others have been working with our counterparts in China, helping them build a cadre of field epidemiologists that could do outbreak detection and response. Um, building influenza, influenza lab and surveillance capability, um, providing technical assistance so that they have, are now a WHO collaborating center for flu, influenza. And the, when H7N9 emerged, they were able to detect it very quickly. They shared the information very quickly. The, the virus was sequenced, and then CDC was able to make a, um, diagnostic kits that were shared actually with the rest of the world very quickly. So I think that's a, a very good example of how this can work. As was mentioned, we've been um, doing demonstration projects in Vietnam and in Uganda with uh, Department of Defense and other partners over the last year. The idea is to accelerate progress towards the, meeting the requirements of the international health regulations. So first, there's these um, helping set up an emergency operations center. So like I said, this is not just a room with computers, although that looks very nice, but it's also having staff trained in incident command system and the idea is to be able to stand up the response within two hours of any incident. You need the information systems to, um, to support that, and then laboratory diagnostic capability, and then the, a way to have a network of transportation so that um, if there's uh, specimens that need to be collected anywhere in the country that they can get to where they need to be for, for diagnosis. We, I really want to congratulate our colleagues in Vietnam and also in Uganda for um, the incredible work that's been accomplished in this one year. I think we were all a bit surprised by how much got accomplished in one year. One of the important things that we've learned is that um, we were able to build on the information systems and the laboratory investments that were made through PEPFAR and other areas to expand the capabilities to the priority diseases that each of the countries has identified and that um, uh, and, and um, yeah, that they've identified to, to focus on. So, for example, in Uganda, there was a, a system for transportation of blood spots for HIV. Um, they used a, a motorcycle and a bus system, and we were able to build upon that system to be able to, um, to use that for uh, transportation of specimens for other diseases. They held a tabletop conference, uh, tabletop exercise there, and within two hours, the, the the emergency operations center was called upon uh, for a suspected Ebola case, and the and the system went into into play and worked successfully. So, very um, very good success in a short period of time there. So, just in summary, I'd like to say that we have a lot of tools and capabilities 
that can contribute to the work in the region and complement the work of our partners. And I think there's a real opportunity to learn um, from the pilots, the demonstration projects that we've had, and to help really build the capacity for IHR um, requirements in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patty. Um, <laughs> I think it's important to also note that over the course of the summer, Secretary Sebelius, Dr. Frieden, Ambassador Kolker uh, were out for an extended visit uh, to uh, uh, Vietnam and Thailand, uh, which uh, really sort of reinforced mm -hmm. the, uh, the momentum and the value that, the, that CDC and, and other related agencies uh, have begun to really make that kind of uh, commitment and investment. Uh, in in the Mekong, um, and uh, uh, you know, I was very struck by that, and struck by how much energy came out of that. Now, Greg, AID um, also has a remarkable sort of regional presence through the RDMA. Uh, it's moved very rapidly in the Mekong transition, as we note in our report, in setting up a very dynamic mission and integrating others like CDC into that. Uh, it has a, a very strong and activist presence here. Yourself, Gary Cook, uh, Shannon Stone, Katie Kutub's with us today, folks that are really quite engaged here. So thank you for being with us. Can you say a few words around how AID is looking at this region uh, and your engagement in it? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's uh, great to be uh, a part of such a dynamic panel. Uh, CDC, Vietnam, Cambodia, all important partners for USAID uh, in the Mekong. And Steve, uh, great to be here in your new, uh, new facility. Thank it's you. terrific. Um, you know, at the very uh, outset of his administration, uh, President Obama made a strategic decision uh, to increase the United States' focus uh, on the Asia-Pacific region by rebalancing U.S. engagements, activities, and resources towards this vital region. Growth and opportunity are certainly on the rise in this part of the world, yet a number of development challenges remain, from high rates of malnutrition to countries still vulnerable to uh, shocks brought on by natural disasters and the impact of global climate change. At the heart of this rebalance uh, is, the Mekong, is the Lower Mekong Initiative. Uh, it is a multinational partnership effort to promote greater cooperation in the Mekong and includes five countries, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It is also, importantly, a, a very robust interagency uh, effort, uh, including many parts of the State Department, USAID, Commerce, U.S. Geological Society, CDC, and, and, and others. And the effort is focused on six development challenges, or we call them pillars, uh, that were decided upon by the five uh, partner countries. As, some of the, as the primary development challenges facing uh, the Lower Mekong region. So the six pillars are made up of agriculture and food security, focusing on connectivity, education, energy, environment and health, and, I'm sorry, environment and water, and lastly, in health. Uh, the LMI has really been designed to uh, serve as a forum for LMI partners to develop shared responses to the most pressing transboundary challenges. And it's also to help to close the development gap uh, as part of ASEAN uh, Integration 2015. The LMI is also designed to be really a catalytic platform that allows LMI uh, partners to engage at the earliest uh, moments with civil society, private sector, think tanks, academic institutions to, to around a common problem set. And it really provides that opportunity to develop then joint action plans that include policy reforms, uh, drives foreign direct investment and also uh, drives program resources from both the bilaterals and the multilateral donors working uh, in the Lower Mekong and in many cases also includes resources from, from the partner countries. A majority of these efforts are managed through our coordination hub based in our regional office in Bangkok and also through our regional working groups that meet throughout the year to develop the individual uh, pillar action plans that then drive resource decisions. And just a couple of examples of what those uh, resources are looking like. Uh, we have a, a program called Comet, which is connecting the Mekong through education and training. It's designed to uh, increase the number of skilled workers in targeted sectors such as science and technology through very innovative approaches using technology and partnership. We also have uh, Server Lower Mekong, 
which will uh, enhance climate change adaptation and landscape management in the subregion through increased application of cutting edge geospatial analysis and mapping. Lastly, we have a program called SIM, where it's bringing together stakeholders with planners and implementers of the large infrastructure projects around the Mekong. Uh, and this allows stakeholders, especially civil society groups, to be engaging with those designers to ensure that their concerns, their equities are protected as those large projects are designed up. Uh, the LMI is also supported by the Friends of the Lower Mekong. Uh, it's an important convening platform and mechanism to improve donor coordination in programming development assistance in the Lower Mekong. Uh, participating, participating FLM members include Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, uh, the EU, ADB, and, and the World Bank. You know, it, it really is a, it is a rapidly changing aidscape uh, in, in the Mekong. Um, and we look at it as, and I press my staff continually to say that if we don't change the way we do business, we will rapidly become irrelevant over the next decade. Uh, and so we need to change uh, the lens in which we look through this business. And so what we try to do is redesign our regional uh, office in uh, Bangkok, RDMA, to be adapting, to be agile, and to be bringing in and responding to what I increasingly hear from our partner countries. So while our, our, our discrete program is, remains very valuable, what I often hear them saying is we also want to be integrating American science and technology into those programs. We want to be capturing those American development, innovative development practices. We want to be tapping into American academic institutions and think tanks. And so we've redesigned RDMA to be responding to that. So we have three parts of RDMA, which is our traditional um, provision of operational services. We have a second component, which is technical uh, advisors to our bilateral countries. And our third component, which is a new one, is we've now staffed up with what we're calling thought leaders. And these are experts in their fields, in the fields of energy, in the field of environment, and in health, and in technology, uh, that are scaling up many of those development practices uh, and making sure that they are integrated and, and, and a, a large part of our Lower Maycock initiative. And then finally, I would say that we've also been uh, redesigning our strategic plans, what we call our country uh, development cooperation uh, strategies. And these are five-year plans where we've now become much more focused and concentrated on what I would consider the, sort of the binding constraints of a successful uh, uh, transition or successful uh, and full development in the Lower Mekong. Uh, and, and these are done through extensive uh, stakeholder engagements. In the case of, say, Indonesia, we had over 1,200 consultations, uh, also in Cambodia and, and Vietnam. So we're adapting and trying to change our way of doing business so we are much more focused and we're bringing in those important elements of, of American science and technology and innovative development practices. Uh, those are just a few of the tools that we're putting into place. I know we're short on time, so I don't want to continue to capture that, but I just want to be uh, here for any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, we can flesh that out a little bit further for you. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, we've heard a lot. We've heard of much progress that's been made in the last decade by these countries, uh, driven by their own, uh, through their own good offices and purpose and vision. We've heard about a little bit of nervousness around the, the future, a little bit of nervousness around how to preserve the, and sustain partnerships with uh, external agencies, the US government, as well as multilaterals and other donors, a nervousness around the challenges of resistance and the challenges of health security, how to cope with this. This is a region where this is a very real set of issues that you face, whether it's antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Yen is very much in the lead on this in terms of the committee globally that's working on this, but we have, anti, uh, we have Artemis and resistant malaria, MDR TB, other threats of emerging, er, emerging pandemics. And structural inequities come across in both of you in your discussions around how do you deal with the poverty and nutritional problems of, of these inequities. Why don't we open now and hear from you. So those of you who uh, would like, please put your hands up. Uh, Amy Shipow's helping us. In the rear, thank you, Amy. Uh, and um, uh, there may be another uh, microphone over here. Um, and so uh, anyone who would care to offer a comment uh, or question, please put your hand up and, and we'll come to you. Over here. 
Please be very brief, very succinct, and uh, one question, please. I'm Foom Tran. I'm a journalist with the Crisis Newswire, founded by the UN. I'm based in Bangkok. We're working on a series, uh, a roundtable with experts uh, to analyze just why the buzz term of hotspot of infectious diseases. I'd like the panel's, um, your thoughts, if you'd like to contribute it, to it, of why it is, biologically or socially, is it ducks, is it population density, why is it a hotspot for infectious diseases? Secondly, I'd like to follow up with Greg later uh, more about thought leaders. Other questions? Questions or comments? Yes, right here. Thank you. My name is Jin Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. My question is to Dr. Nguyen. Thank you for being here and also to Dr. Oa because we share the same challenges. Would you um, talk about more about the equity uh, in the healthcare system given in Vietnam and how that affects your moving forward? Uh, progress. Also, you did mention, Dr. Nguyen, very strongly the political commitment of the whole system, especially in responding to epidemic uh, situations. So where do you see the current uh, commitment and how do we promote that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. There's a hand in the rear there, Amy. Uh, thanks very much. Adam Camrad Scott from um, University of Sydney. I guess I've been reading through the report and listening to the comments and I'm just interested to hear a little bit more about how you're planning on engaging with other partners in the region. Australia did get a mention. Obviously we've got a very strong vested interest in the region as well, um, looking at health security issues too, so I'm just interested in hearing more about that. Great. We can take one more in this round if anyone would like to jump in. Yes, Karen? Karen Gorleski with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, historically, the infectious disease community has been very separate from the non-communicable disease community. And what steps could the panel take to help bring these two very important groups together? Excellent. Um, I just want to congratulate Karen and Alan McGill. Uh, the, the annual conference of the uh, ASTMH uh, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene begins tomorrow, as I recall, or tonight, and is bringing forward some 3,300, 3,400 experts here to Washington uh, for that. So congratulations. We have made a special effort today to try and uh, bring into our midst here folks who can get here early uh, for that. But congratulations and thank you for all your help. So we have uh, on the table questions around why is this a hot spot? Uh, from Jenny, question around equity and political commitment. From Adam, how do you engage the Australians and other, other players, Japan, uh, Thailand, uh, other donor players with, within the region? And from Karen, how do you bridge the infectious disease and non-communicable disease divide in terms of the communities and outlooks and, and the like? Um, Dr. Hien, would you like, you can take any mix of these that you care to address, but I'd like to turn to you and Dr. Orr to, to offer the first responses, and then we'll hear from, uh, from Greg and Pat. Dr. Hien. Yes, thank you very much for your questions. I'd like to argue with you some uh, questions you raised. First of all, why Asian countries have been considering a hotspot for emerging infectious diseases? I've mentioned to you that this region has some special specific I think, characteristics. That is a crowded, crowded uh, population and the high growth of population rate in the region. And uh, this region has many, uh, I think, things that can uh, contribute to the hotspot, such as uh, mobility, high mobility, both for the human and animals uh, cross border. And also that uh, uh, the development of, of agriculture and livestock that makes the interaction between animal and human mm -hmm. more stronger. And also that um, a lot of activities to do uh, uh, economic development, including uh, deforestation. And that makes the ecology change and make people, make humans more exposed to the pathogens from animals. 
and that makes the, this, sorry, I had to this one. Makes situation become more complicated. It's here we do study with CDC support on animal-human interface. And we found that uh, duck, chicken, and uh, pork, and pigs, and even cats, live together in, with human in the very crowded area. And we found that there was a exchange between viruses of influenza uh, subtype among those population. And uh, therefore, I think that uh, the Asian countries become very hot spot. And, uh, in reality, Ono saw that the, almost the new pathogen starting from this area. And therefore, I think it's not so easy to control emerging. Even we have to accept the, the, the situation. But how to reduce, to minimize the risk for emerging and emerging infection disease in this area? We cannot predict which pathogen will emerge in the future. And therefore, I think we should uh, prepare for, for the future like this. And second question about equity. Equity is uh, our policy to provide equitable services to all the people in our country. But in reality, it's not so easy. Because uh, we have, have long country with uh, more than 50 ethnic, ethnic minorities. And in some other areas, the living condition and also the control factors uh, make uh, the, the, the equitable services become more difficult. Talking, for example, about EPI program, immunization. Uh, we uh, have very high coverage of vaccination in the country, in more, more than 90%, even more than 95% in urban area. But in some district, the remote area, it's difficult to reach even. Uh, the, the coverage not still low, lower than 90%. Or we provide uh, uh, maternal and, and child services to ensure that uh, we eliminate uh, neonatal tetanus. But still, in some areas, still hotspot for uh, the tet tetanus. The issue now, we are working closely with UNICEF to develop a good mechanism, good I think, action plan, how to uh, uh, provide the services to the remote area. But still, it's a big challenge for us. Even have very good policy, but actually in reality, it's still a lot of difficult difficulty to to ensure that the equity uh, in, in in healthcare in future. And uh, the third about the political commi commitment, Vietnam may be the only country in the world, not so many countries in the world, have very strong political system, from central level to that down to village level. We have a party. We have a uh, government authorities at all level. And uh, even we have a uh, big lesson in, in the past during the war with many different uh, 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 things. And when country, when the government uh, mobilized the whole political system, we achieved something. Even in very deep, difficult area, the different time during the war with France, and even China, Chinese, in the US, and many others. But when the government mobilize the whole community, whole, whole society, you can mobilize whole resources. The same for uh, infectious diseases, for example, for the SARS, for even influenza. And when the government mobilize the whole political system, everybody, everyone, every organization involved in this process. And it's been that we mobilize the whole political, uh, all the uh, community participation and we achieve uh, our, our objectives. And Vietnam is most, uh, the first country in the world to announce that we control successfully SARS, and, announce, and then even influenza, and now other epidemics. And sometimes, someone told me that it seems that Vietnam has some polygon button. If the, the policy maker press the button, and some whole system will in, in be mobilized. And we learn from the, the past, and then now, if something happened, the Prime Minister always issued the, 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 the announcement that we mobilize the whole political system to against cholera, to against dengue, to against a handful of disease. And that, that we actually learn that political system uh, and commitment play a very important role. Even uh, down grassroots level in common level, we have to, uh, in every commons, they have a so-called committee 
So there's still a committee to prevent infectious diseases or to prevent emerging, emerging infectious diseases or a still committee for primary health care. That committee including different sectors, in close uh, section and sectors in that committee. And when something happens, they have meeting and they discuss how to solve this issue. This is the whole committee uh, will mobilize for action. I think that lesson we learned, that's very important. We cannot do our own from technical point of view, but we have to, to ask people to, to aware that that's their duty, that their work, that their need, they should uh, act for themselves. And about the, how the CDN and NCD, uh, communicable disease and non disease, as you said, is separately. Vietnam, so far now, is a very funny, I think, system. NCD now is in charge by not only preventive medicine system, but by curative care system, by hospitals. And therefore, in the last 10 years, we received support from WHO, from others, and that taking care by curative care system. And they focus mainly on treatment of, uh, of NCD, of vascular cancer and diabetes. But very little to be, uh, to be paid on how to do intervention or prevention in, at COVID-11, how to reduce the risk of uh, NCD, it's more important. And even our NCD, National Institute of Hygiene and Epidemiology, we have that both duty, duty to control CD and control NCD. But we have very limited, very limited I think, capacity on this area because in the past we focused mainly our effort to CD. But now NCD emerging and increasing, we start to increase our capacity to deal with uh, NCD by starting to do some uh, community-based surveillance program to, uh, to measure the uh, mortality, morbidity of uh, NCD at community, to measure the risk for NCD, and to do some small intervention to reduce the risk for NCD. And, and it's very important that how to work together to this, to this system, system. And I think that we have to make use our system for preventive medicine, for infectious diseases, and now for uh, NCD together. We use the same staff, same approach of a uh, surveillance system. And we have to ask them just to provide some, some capacity to NCD surveillance and to uh, in, increase capacity to do uh, uh, as risk assessment and to do intervention to reduce the risk. And as I said to you, that we should uh, uh, use our existing system. You cannot create other system, but it's the same system, same staff, but to just provide technical support and supervision and capacity to do their work better. Thank you. Yeah. We're getting close to the end. Uh, Dr. Orr, I'd like you to offer your responses on these, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to close in order to move to our next panel. I apologize to Greg and Patty for, uh, for uh, truncating things, but Dr. Orr, could you offer your thoughts on those issues that were put yeah. on the table? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, I think um, because time is uh, now, so I just uh, want to uh, compliment what uh, our colleague uh, from Vietnam already uh, respond to some of your questions. Uh, one of the uh, questions come up about how to engage our uh, development partner uh, in the health security. I think this is a, a difficult uh, area that uh, we are dealing, especially uh, as I'm the director of international cooperation of the Ministry of Health. It's a lot of headache every day, <laughs> I have to say that. And uh, as you may know that uh, within the uh, Cambodian uh, government, we have the um, uh, system on how we uh, engage with our uh, development partner in order to assist uh, the country. As you may recall that um, after liberation in 1979 from the genocide regime, which um, one of the survival of, from that uh, regime, uh, we tried at that time to call for the support to rebuild our country. And at that time, whatever support that our uh, partner can provide it, we just accept it. But since the uh, evolution of the country, uh, especially the development of the country with the uh, free economic uh, open, so um, uh, we have to think on how we are uh, putting, uh, especially the uh, engage with our uh, partner to abide by our uh, priority rather than uh, 
doing whatever they do, I have to say that. Yeah. So that's why uh, we have at the government level, we have the uh, government development partner uh, forum, uh, which is lead, uh, lead by our prime minister. And below that, we have the uh, 19 uh, technical working group in, in each line ministry. And in the health sector, we have the technical working group for health, which is the forum, is the platform for the uh, uh, discussing the uh, priority as well as uh, the health issue uh, in the country, including uh, monitor the progress of the uh, uh, agreed work plan uh, at the country level. In that, it comes to the uh, engagement day to day uh, in form of uh, uh, looking at what are, together, what are the uh, priority that we need to, to tackle in the health sector. And of course, um, when we start the, the country, uh, when the people just, most of the survivors from the genocide regime, uh, most of them uh, it's uh, exposed to the infectious disease easily. So that's why at that time, uh, we try to uh, really uh, help them in order to uh, uh, cure and prevent the uh, transmission of disease. But later on, when the uh, economic growth and the uh, uh, changing lifestyle, including the change the uh, eating habit of, of the people, especially for the young generation now, um, the non-communicable disease now uh, become apparent. So that's why I uh, come to one of the questions, why ID and NCD, it's quite different, it's not coming together. But now, we have to think how can we put this uh, package together, so that's why we are in the process of looking at how we can uh, integrate the uh, NCD uh, care and prevention into the healthcare services, which is before we have only in the health system, like uh, at the health center, at the referral hospital, or the national hospital, uh, pretty much uh, oriented on the uh, uh, HIV, TB, malaria, and other uh, infectious <coughs> diseases like uh, diarrhea and uh, uh, AR, a, a or something like that. But now we have to think about how can uh, we do for this uh, particular area. And I hope that in the future with the effort and support uh, technically from WHO and financially from uh, our health partner, we have the, uh, a lot of health partner working in Cambodia now. And uh, I hope USID and CDC also will uh, continue to support then uh, we will see how can we do for this particular area. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panelists.